welcome to this brand new week of broadcasting here on America Family Radio Talk Network. Brian Fisher is my name, your congenial, convivial, and amiable, as always, host. Great to have you in the conversation. Going to be talking with Nathan Harper in just about 10 minutes. He works with refugees in the Atlanta area. And I think it's an important issue for us to focus some attention on. You know, we've talked a lot about immigration and what our immigration policies ought to be. But the reality is, regardless of what you think our immigration policies ought to be, we have literally millions of refugees in the United States of America. Well, hundreds of thousands anyway. I'm not sure what the exact total is, but a lot of refugees. And a lot of them have settled in the Atlanta area. So the, the, the question that the church has got to ask itself is, okay, these refugees are here. Uh, they are living in the United States of America. What is the responsibility of the church toward these refugees? Is there an opportunity here that the church ought to respond to, some needs that the church can meet? Is this an opportunity to advance the kingdom of God? And we'll talk to uh, Nathan about that. In the second hour at 2.15, we'll have Stephen Meyer, who is with the Discovery Center in Seattle. They work on intelligent design. Got a story out of a Museum of Natural History in L.A. that removed a reference to God. A, a significant donor had put a reference to God as the creator and creatures as God's creatures as a part of the plaque that went with his donation, and the museum scrapped the quote. We don't want it. We don't want that anywhere in our museum because it might create the impression that God had something to do with the origin of life. So we'll talk to Steve Meyer about that, also about his brand new book, Darwin's Doubt That, at 2.15 Central Time today. Now, before we uh, turn our attention to all of that, want to look at the 19th chapter of the book of Acts, which has Paul in the city of Ephesus. He found some disciples that had only been introduced to the teaching of John and to the baptism of John, which, remember, was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, John had spoken of a coming one, a Messiah who would come, and when he came, he would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. And all, of the, all, all that these men knew was the baptism of John and his promise that someone was coming who would baptize people not just with water but with fire and with the Holy Spirit. And so Paul finds these, there are about a dozen of them, that are still absorbed in the teaching of John. It says, if you heard about the Holy Spirit, it says, we don't even know that there is a Holy Spirit. I think the point is, we don't know that the Holy Spirit has been given. And Paul said this, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues or literally languages and prophesying. There are about 12 men in all. This is the third time now in the book of Acts where we see that when men receive, place their faith in Christ, and the Holy Spirit came on them, he gave them the capacity to speak in human languages Languages that are spoken somewhere on the face of the earth, but a language that they had not learned. These are not, this is not gibberish. These are actual languages that are spoken somewhere on the globe. And the fact that someone could miraculously, spectacularly, begin speaking fluently in a language that they hadn't learned, that they hadn't studied, would be a powerful testimony that something supernatural and something of God was here. Now, Ephesus is a very cosmopolitan Town, and that's why this would be particularly significant there because there would be people in the city of Ephesus just like there were in Jerusalem when Peter gave his message in Acts 2 who heard people speaking of the wonders of God in their own languages and not only in their own languages but in their own regional dialects. And this was what got their attention. Something of God is going on. And the same thing is happening here in Acts 19. This is Luke's way of saying, look, the same power that was at work in Peter, that same power was at work in and through the Apostle Paul. So Paul goes into the synagogue there in Ephesus, and for three months he spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. So notice he spoke boldly, he spoke frankly, he spoke directly, he didn't pull any punches, he told it like it was. He reasoned with them, there was dialogue, there was discussion, there was debate. He entertained their questions. 
He sought to answer their questions, and he sought to persuade them. In other words, he encouraged them to consider the claims of the gospel, come to faith in Christ. But, verse 9, when some became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way, he withdrew from them, took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. So this was a rented facility. So the, the practice of the church meeting in rented facilities, school facilities, this Tyrannus was probably a lecturer in philosophy or something like this, and he had built this classroom, this sort of education annex, and this is what Paul rented. Paul rented this space from him, and the Western text, one of the Greek uh, text traditions, indicates that Paul met every day with disciples to teach them from 11 in the morning to 4 in the afternoon. That was the siesta. In Mediterranean cultures, they would take a long break. They'd get up early, open their shops early, take a break for the afternoon siesta, open their shops up again late in the afternoon. Paul took advantage of that window of time and basically held the first Bible school, the first seminary that we know of there in the city of Ephesus. He continued to do this for two years. And during this time, Paul, miraculous things were being done through Paul, handkerchiefs and aprons that he had used in his tent-making trade that had been in contact with his body. They were taken, and the mere contact of the aprons and handkerchiefs that had been in touch with Paul's body when they were placed on the sick, the sick were healed, and people were delivered of demons. And there's a story about these two Jewish high priests that did not know Christ. They saw what Paul was doing, the power of the name of Christ. They tried to use the name of the power of Christ to deliver people, deliver people from demons. But the evil spirit inside the guy answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the evil spirit, or the man in whom was the evil spirit, leaped on them, mastered both of them, there were two of them doing this, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded, and this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And then they brought all of their occult books and charms and amulets and potions, these superstitious things in which they had believed, and they came and burned them and destroyed them. About $5 million worth of documents they committed to the flames because they realized it was superstition and lies of the evil one. They were dabbling in dark powers and wanted to reserve themselves for Jesus Christ and true spirituality. Well, let's go to prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit will come in fullness on each of us, on me, my family, listening audience of Focal Point and AFR Talk, President Obama, all of our elected officials, every man, woman, and child in this land. And I pray that we may be empowered by you for every task you have for us. I pray that you will give us all opportunity as you see fit to speak boldly and argue persuasively about the kingdom of God. Lord, we recognize that there will be those who will become obstinate and refuse to believe and will even publicly malign the way. Grant us wisdom and perseverance should we encounter that kind of resistance. I pray that we will continue to study and be taught the scriptures and that through our life and ministry, everyone who lives in our city and nation will hear your word. We ask together that you will do extraordinary miracles in our community to confirm your word. We pray that those who engage in occult practices will come and openly confess their evil deeds. In Jesus' name, amen.